Hello, I'm Grace Vandenberg. I put it out there the past couple of weeks while I was accepting your questions, since I've been getting so many via DM. So I thought it would be easier and simpler to put all your curious questions and my honest answers into one place. So your burning questions began with. What was the best decision I made in making my career happen? At first, this wasn't a simple decision, not at all. I wasn't from a natural habitat that had a plethora of ambition, meaning people tend to either not work or seek higher education. Others would stumble into the type of job one would expect: shop assistant, cleaners, childminders. That sort of thing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. There's not. A job of any description is honourable. But it wasn't the scene for me to be around to stumble into something else, to even think about doing something else, or even in the beginning, just trying to do something else, other than the norm. And it was perceived as me being above my station. Therefore, this angered a lot of people. As my first book launched, leading to me receiving indescribable abuse when I was covered briefly in another conversation, so preparing myself for what I knew would ultimately come my way in time, when people knew, was the first major alteration I needed to embark upon. Otherwise, I would never have managed to get a completion. Just look at how many people start books and never finish them. Altering my mindset so I could carry on trying to achieve and accomplish something with my life was the most crucial decision I ever made. From there, regarding the professional side, it was quite simply moving to France. What I have come to dislike about where I'm originally from is that the people who are in positions to make your career or take your career to the next level. Don't. Many are lazy. Others are snobby, and with that comes an unnecessary arrogance. Then you have the PC world of not belonging to the correct demographic for that particular year. Therefore, everything is made more challenging. Buried in mind is already a challenging industry. Bottom line: the best decision I ever made was by leaving. And getting my rear over to France, and getting a French agent. You only get to dream and dream big if you surround yourself by those who take action and accomplish. Your next question: Is it hard to make friends in France? I would love to give you a very lovely answer here and say no, it's not hard. But that wouldn't be honest or realistic because it is extremely hard. My husband and I have been in France for years, and we still don't have a single solitary French friend. The one thing that I will、mm, say <laughs> is definitely they are extremely aloof. It means that they're not friendly or anything like that. They're extremely friendly. I mean, I know French are supposed to have this reputation for being rude and not very, not very polite. But there are some. Ever, but you get that everywhere. So we can't say that that is only the French people. That's not true. I've met only a very small portion that weren't polite. But everyone else are extremely polite and courteous and helpful.、Um, but they just. Don't exactly open their doors or their hearts to make friends with you very quickly or very easily. However, I am reassured that when you get through the threshold of them starting to kind of get a sense of who you are, that when you do make friends with French people, they're friends for life. So I'm still looking forward to that, to be perfectly honest. But I do know and have had a sense of that French people are very, very loyal to themselves and their own. 
for the most part, people make friends when they're young, like at school and such, and they keep those friendships for the rest of their lives. And I think that speaks volumes for them and their their character. And they really shouldn't necessarily be criticized for that because I think it's a very honorable trait. But most expats don't realistically have fr- a bunch of French friends per se. Expats tend to make friends with expats, and for me, that's very sad because I've been privileged to travel a lot in my life and to have lived in many different places. And I'm the kind of person when I move someplace, I want to embrace that culture. I don't want to go there and change their culture to conform with mine or my beliefs or anything like that in any capacity, whether it's fashion or modestly being modestly dressed. Or speech, or asking them to speak English because I don't speak adequate French. It's not anything like that. It's like a whole plethora of things that don't even come up until you're there, that you don't even take into accountability until you're there because you haven't crossed those bridges, so to speak. So for me, it was. It's very sad because I'm the kind of person. If I, it's like that saying, "When in Rome, do as the Romans." And when I'm in France or Switzerland or wherever I am. I want to take on their culture and embrace that, and make it part of who I am, and adapt my life to to living that way and implementing these things that make us a broader-minded person. I love being broader-minded. I mean, I come from a culture that's very narrow-minded, very small and boxed in, and it's not healthy. It's not happy to to live with those limitations. So, when I go places, I want to really incorporate what makes that place. That place so famous in its own right, so respected in its own right, and unfortunately, it's very difficult to do that when you're not around the authentic French. If you know what I mean, that you can be there and learn little tidbits from other British people or Americans or Australians or whoever, whoever isn't originally French and wasn't born there and grew up within their culture, and learn tidbits from them. But if you're not learning directly from a French person, it's You know, it's sad. I would. I really like to learn everything that's French from French people, so it's authentic in a way. Like kind of like Americans when they cook Italian food, it's like, well, it's not authentic Italian food if it's not, you know, cooked in Italy and things. Just little things like that. It's not that there's anything right or wrong about it. I just like to learn and fill my brain with absolute facts rather than perceptions and stereotypes. If that makes sense. So now a very random question. This is why I decided to do this video because they were very random DM questions, and、um, so we've gone from French my or my my career to making friends in France to what is the best foundation I used in 2022? And hands down, it was absolutely Neutrogena. It is such a skin light light. Formula that really doesn't look like you're wearing anything, and gives you just that bright, healthy glow without looking like you're shining from out of the stratosphere or anything like that. It's just such a comfortable makeup to wear, and I don't wear a lot of makeup. Um, typically, I'm very French in that way, and I've been very French in that way before I even moved to France. Um, so I've taken a lot of inspiration from the French, you know, makeup artists and fashion and all that kind of thing, trying to adapt my life before I even moved to the country. So for me, it has to be the lighter, the foundation, the better. And、um, so yeah, so it's definitely the Neutrogena. And the next question, another makeup one. What was the best makeup remover I used in 2022? Well, admittedly, I was a little late to this game. <laughs> I've seen this one out in about four years, and I just never, I don't know, I just never really felt the need to order it. But this year I did, and I ordered it just before Christmas, and I've already used it. It's completely gone now, and it was the Elmas. You know, the little pot that smells absolutely divine, <laughs> and it works. Oh my goodness! It really, really does work, and it's so easy melting the、um, cosmetic and then washing away, and it doesn't irritate my skin. Even though it is a very strong scent, and I have super, super sensitive skin, it it didn't affect me one little bit, and it was such a it was just such a a treat to 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 use because it smelled like perfume, <laughs> absolutely gorgeous. So that was definitely the best. Now that I've finished that one, I'm back to my original, <laughs> which is the L'Oreal 
yeah, the L'Oreal, um, you know, the pink one, the, the floral, floral one, which I do like, but it's, yeah, once, you, once you've had a really, really good one, <laughs> you know, when one could perform a little bit better, but it's still good as well. But the Elm is hands down is my number one this year. Next question, do I contour? <laughs> yeah, the answer quite short and simple is nope, I don't tend to. Um, I've only really just started to maybe do it a little bit more often in a sense when I'm recording just because of the lights and dimension because I notice when I do French makeup, it's very minimal and I love that. That's my always my go-to. However, with the whenever I have harsh lights on my face for recording for video or if I'm on television or what, whatever have you, um, I do look quite flat. So apart from that, nope, in general, day-to-day -day life, never. I don't really like that particular look. Um, so next question, do I bake? Originally, I was didn't even know what this was because I didn't do it. Um, again, unless it's a photo shoot, no. And even then, I try to stay away from that. I just don't like the over-filtered makeup look. I like it, like I say, more French, where it's more natural, more supple. And it doesn't look like I've got a whole lot of stuff on my face. So no, I definitely don't do not do that. What is my favorite style of makeup? I think if you know me, you know by now that it's hands down the Parisian style. And I've been asked, not necessarily my DMs, but I have been asked over the years. So I'll just incorporate that into this answer now. Um... Why is it, what is it that I love so much about the Parisian look? Is it because it's just simple, quick and easy? And that wasn't what attracted me to it actually, but it is definitely a perk um, and a time saver. <laughs> if you're a working lady, you'll know exactly what I mean. Um, it's more the fact that it's very subtle, but it's extremely, extremely feminine. I always say to my husband, I'm not the sexy type of woman. <laughs> And he always refutes it, but I really, you know, I'm not the kind of woman that wears necessarily provocative clothes, so I don't necessarily wear provocative type makeup that there's anything wrong with it. It's just not my style. It doesn't speak to me, and I like that look on other women. It just isn't who I am, and I don't think, to be quite honest, I could pull it off. I don't know. I haven't tried it, but I don't think I could, whereas the Parisian, it's very... Pared down, but extremely feminine in my in my opinion, and it's um, I don't know, it's just sophisticated, timeless, classic, very Audrey Hepburn, um, in a sense as well in some of her her past movies and certainly in her um, editorials, um, for magazines and things. Um, so I just yeah, I just I just like it. It's just one of those. I'm a very old soul, so anything kind of old fashioned speaks to me, and so maybe that's why it speaks to me so well. Now the next question is a very random one again. Where do I see myself in five years from today? And the answer is quite simply again, I truly don't know. I try not to think that far ahead, to be perfectly honest, to avoid anxiety. I had a very tumultuous upbringing, to say the very least, and there were challenges there. So I ended up being very, very depressed throughout my teenage years and my 20s, and really only getting a handle of that in my 30s, whereas now I don't suffer from that at all, and I'm fully recovered, thankfully. So I try to avoid thinking too deeply or thinking too far ahead. But in saying that, from a professional standpoint, I do have to think of certain things at certain times. So to answer this as honestly as I possibly can, I do casually plan each year kind of sneakily in my own mind here and there, meaning without deep thought. I know what I want to achieve. I don't know how long it's going to take. So I don't put those constraints on myself because I've had people work for me, like third parties work for me before. And like I've kind of briefly mentioned in past conversation, um, they didn't do their job. And where you should have been, you weren't at that stage because these people weren't doing that. They're, what they were employed to do. 
And therefore, it's heartbreaking when you get to that time, that year that you set yourself, that time stamp that you set aside for yourself. And it was a realistic time stamp. So it wasn't that it was anything unrealistic. It was very realistic. And when you don't meet it, it's very heartbreaking and soul destroying that everything is basically dependent on the third party. You don't have that kind of control over your own life, over your own career, over your own accomplishment. And so because that could very easily get you down, I avoid thinking that too much too often. So after the Queen's death, I pined for Britain again, to be perfectly honest. And I even proposed that I was going to stay another year in France and then potentially move back to somewhere in the UK. However, since doing my research again, um, with the mess the UK is currently in for many, many reasons, which I will not get into on this channel ever, I don't honestly see myself there at any point. And that's so sad. Though I had started to consider England in the new year, 2023, 2024, something like that. I just don't think, I just don't know right now. And I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm proven wrong at some point that my next level will be there because it'd be so nice to come from the nation that you're from and elevate in that nation rather than having to leave and be somewhere else but I honestly can't see that at this particular junction and so not I'm not sure about in five years time but but someday before I die I will give you this I will be honest about this someday before I die the dream would be living in Switzerland and visiting Italy a lot but from a professional standpoint I honestly can call it it's such a slow challenging industry that you really cannot put a timestamp on that but in five years time I hope I'm just I'm a little bit more successful than I am today how am I always so positive Trust me when I say I have my down days, my pitfalls, those pesty little thoughts that creep inside the dorms of my mind, hence why I try not to think so deeply as I once did. But most of the time I am positive because I wasted so much time not being positive in the past. If you'd met me up until perhaps five years ago, I wasn't an overly confident person at all. Though up until eight years ago, I really was trying to find my feet. And there were plenty of times I thought I was never going to to manage it. So in a roundabout way, not that this has been a question, I'm just putting this in here. In a roundabout way, finding and developing my own confidence has been the greatest, my personal greatest accomplishments thus far as it was extremely challenging for me, for many, many reasons. I think because I've been through so much in my life, early life, I know the face of evil and the face of malice. So not wanting to go back into those dark days is the energy I necessitate to keep up the tracks of positivity and high energy. So I used to be a weaker person, but not anymore. That inner strength we all need in order to battle, quite simply, life. (laughs) And all these many challenges is what helps me from falling victim to the recklessness of negativity. Side note, in my personal opinion from experience and life lived, negativity really is, to me at least, reckless. And the only way to avoid that is to constantly Every day, apply the effort to stay and remain in control. Think a speeding car. A speeding driver pulling out around a bend, unable to see if anything is coming. And smash right into head first another speeding car. That's what negativity and the wrong headspace is and does. We can do that to ourselves on constant replay. It's not fun. So take control and command your root. Is Paris really romantic? The reality is, Paris is a cosmopolitan. As any capital, there's crime and dangers. There's beauty and not so much beauty. 
It really depends on where you feel near. Therefore, like anywhere, one needs to not get carried away with the romanticism of a place and keep in mind one's own surroundings. And that, my friends, is the best advice anyone can have when they venture into a foreign and unfamiliar playground. However, it is a beautiful city. Beautiful architecture, museums, the history, the whole of France, and Paris is no exception, is steeped in so much history. And I've never felt an, even an atmosphere like it anywhere. And it's one that, to me, in my personal existence, is synonymous to France, because you can literally feel, like, it's, because it's been so preserved, you can feel like you're in that moment when things happened, the, the, the war and people suffering, you can actually feel that when you go to certain places. And that is such a special, special feeling to me because I'm just such a history buff. Then we have the fashion, of course, and the fashion houses. And if you're with someone very special to you, it certainly can be romantic. But remember, it's also very congested. Therefore, you're not going to want to be in a certain places that's too loud, too many people, if it's romance you're hunting for. But there's so many dreamy, beautiful places to go, like incredible restaurants and bistros, rivers, lakes and chateaus. And chateaus that are special, hotels and restaurants in one. Even in romantic walks, it pays to be alert, as one might in New York or London. Remember, cities are cities everywhere. And if you're watching an Audrey Hepburn movie or the such, remember, the times have changed and things have not stayed that way. So you also need to remember we're in the modern day and implement all of the strategies you probably would anywhere else in keeping safe while you enjoy the dreamy side of Paris. Side note, don't walk with your phone out in front of you. People on foot, motorcycles or even push bikes can run up and snap it out of your hand, believe it or not. And women, I'd be careful with the type of handbags I'd wear as well. I'd offer one of those secure like a crossbody instead of a cute, dainty little Chanel style or large mini suitcase over your shoulder like a slouch bag. I personally would understate the jewellery as well. How much time do I stay in social media? I have a timer on my Instagram, but I don't really need it. I spend no more than five minutes a day on all my social media. Honestly, I have taken such control of my timekeeping, my objectives, and how I know I want to get there. I have all my posts pre-organized. I quickly type in a subtitle and hashtag, and hey, I'm done. And yes, I do generally copy and paste my hashtags, and every so often I might change it up here and there, but generally that's the gist. The longest I'm on YouTube is when I'm uploading my videos and filling in the description boxes. If I have messages and DMs from you lovely guys, then I will quickly skim through and see if I need to answer any of them or if it's just unimportant spam. I limit how much I talk to people as well. No offense to anyone. It's just me taking control of my life, my time and my goals. Put it this way. If I spend five hours a day talking to people I don't know or scrolling through other people's feed mindlessly, that's five hours out of my day I'm never going to get back and will never fill up with something that is going to pay off. Into the bargain, all that blue light on my poor little eyes on top of all that blue light that I spend looking into when I'm writing? Mm, no, <laughs> respect yourself more. No disrespect to the social aspect of social media, but, produ but productivity people don't be mindless in any avenue of their life. So, if you say to me, I've got work to do in the department of spending less online time, I feel like, my love, it's not hard. Make a list of all your objectives for the month, 
for the year. Say now, for this new year, moving forward, and ask yourself the serious question. And I mean a very serious question. If I spent all this time online, I won't make this deadline successfully. Is scrolling through pretty pictures that's all set up any hood worth not meeting that target? And besides, and if you don't make that up, that deadline, or you don't achieve that particular goal that week or month and you keep putting it off, you're very likely never going to achieve it. And then ask yourself a subsequent question. If you don't do it for yourself, who's going to do it for you? I don't think you're going to be very impressed with how many people you think are actually going to do things for you if you don't do them for yourself. For me, no one apart from my husband is worth taking time away from something important to me just for the sake of it. Family time should be prioritized too. Respect yourself and respect your family. Until next time, I'm Grace Vandenberg.